Have you ever considered the impact that your food has on the planet? Agriculture, forestry and land use are responsible for about a quarter of our global greenhouse gas emissions. And with global food demand expected to rise by 42% by 2050, it seems very important to talk about solutions. And that's exactly what this episode of the Circular Economy Show is going to be all about. Let us take you on a tour around the world as we show you what some of these solutions look like in different settings. We'll be hearing from key actors influencing the future of the food on your plate. So let's get started. Welcome to the Circular Economy Show by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, where we develop and promote the idea of a circular economy, engage key actors in the system and mobilize solutions at scale. My name is Laura Franco. I am part of the team here at the Foundation and I will be the host of this episode of the Circular Economy Show. Before we get started, let me remind you at home that you can chip in and ask your questions. You can do that by utilizing the chat function on YouTube, Facebook, uh, YouTube, or wherever you are watching this stream on. And the team behind the scenes will pass them on to me. Now, as promised, we will take you to different places from Kenya to Brazil to show you what some of these regenerative food production practices look like. Um, you will hear from policymakers, farmers, and you will also hear the perspective from a very big business. But now, I will be introducing my guests along the way, but I have asked Nick Jeffries from our food team to help us get started with a, with a quick Q&A uh, to set up the scene and explain to us what regenerative agriculture is all about. Welcome, Nick. Thank you for being with us uh, here today. We're going to be talking a lot about food production, but we know that food production is only one of the elements of the food system. So for our audience, could you explain in 30 seconds what is a food system? <laughs> OK, I'll try. Hi, Lara. Great to be back on the show. Yeah, so we as humans, we eat a lot of food, on average about 700 kilos a year. And so just on our little island where we are now, 140,000 people, that's about 100,000 tonnes of food a year, which is about the same as 10 Eiffel Towers. So the food system is the mechanism by which it sort of feeds the population. And, and what it is, the food system, it's a, sort of, it's a complex web of different actors, different processes, different infrastructure that feeds places like the Isle of Wight. And the food system has sort of several stages in it. You produce the food, you farm it, uh, you harvest it, you process, you transport, retail, marketing, restaurants, and then finally, managing of the waste. The Isle of Wight, for any of our of the audience watching us, we are based in the UK yeah. and it's south south of the of the country. And this time, I'm going to give you one minute. I spoke in the beginning of this session about the global greenhouse gas emissions that come from agriculture, uh, but there are, the problem is much bigger than this. Could you tell us a little bit more about the problems of our current food system? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So all of these food systems taken together is, is, a, is the overall global food system, and it's huge, and it generates about between 20 to 30 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but there are more, there are more challenges as well. And let's acknowledge that our modern food system has given us, you know, many great things. Uh, but there are also, it is also challenged in a number of ways. And I, I sort of reduce it to like the three big ones, which is we waste a lot of food. The way we produce food is very degrading of nature and also it's not particularly healthy uh, for people. There's a lot of people who are very hungry and there's a lot of people who get very sick from food. Yeah. Uh, Around a third of our, of our edible food goes to waste. Yeah, about, is that correct? Yeah, about 30 percent of food that we grow is wasted. Yeah. So, so Nick, now this, the topic of this episode, regenerative agriculture, what is, what is this? How can, how can we explain this to, to our audience to, get, to help us get started before we talk to our guests? OK, so regenerative agriculture is one of a, a sort of set of solutions that are needed to, to transform uh, the food system into a, into a better place. Yeah? So it's not just one, it's, there's no one silver bullet. But what I like about regenerative agriculture, and regenerative agriculture is, is just essentially farming in a way that has a sort of more positive impact on nature and, and health and, and so on 
is that when you start looking at regenerative agriculture, you start seeing something that not only can produce great nutritious food, but it can also be a really, really important tool to address some of like, these huge global challenges. You mentioned climate change, but biodiversity loss is also a huge, you know, is also a very, very uh, important thing that we need to deal with. Um, but that, so, it's, so regenerative agriculture, agriculture is about a set of outcomes that we're trying to achieve, better soil health, more biodiversity, better, more infiltration of water into soils, so you have better, more resilient farming systems. And then there's a whole suite of practices that then can help achieve these outcomes. But we really should focus on outcomes rather than the practices. Um, so it's about, about more than applying just one practice. It's about really taking into account all these outcomes that, that you just mentioned. And I guess also the context of where you are applying this is also very important. And you mentioned two huge issues, climate change, biodiversity loss. How, what, what is the potential of changing the food system to address these two global challenges? Yeah, well, I think it has more than any sector of our economy, it has the greatest potential to impact those two huge global challenges. And there are many other global challenges, but they're the big ones. But it's, it requires, as I said before, there is no silver bullet. You also, that, that you also need to look at subsidies. You also need to look at, um, uh, you, uh, there's many other diet, diet shifts. You need to look at um, political things. There are a number of things, but, Taken together all these things, I think I'm optimistic that the food, the way we produce food can be a really powerful tool to get, we where we, get, get us where we need to be. And one final question. We're going to be mainly focusing about regenerative agriculture in this episode. But when we speak about the circular economy for food, are we talking about more? You mentioned food waste, you mentioned keeping materials in use. Are these the sort of things that, you, that come to mind when I... Uh, well, when we apply a circular economy to the food system, regenerative agriculture is obviously a very, very important one, but also reducing food waste uh, is another really important one. If we could reduce even by half the amount of food that we waste at the moment, and we waste it for different reasons, by the way, that means we wouldn't have to expand our agricultural areas, and so we'll have more areas of our earth that can be used for supporting healthy wildlife. Um, but there are also, uh, there, and there's also other ways, a lot of the stuff that, that is wasted is un unavoidable. We can't, we can't actually eat potato peels or coffee grounds, but those kind of things can be turned into valuable products. Um, uh, they can feed, become feedstock for a bioeconomy, but they can also go back to the farming areas to um, provide nutrients, to create healthy soils for the next, uh, next harvest of food. Thank you, Nick. Thank you for helping us get started. Mm. Now, let's see how we can achieve some of these things. Our first stop is going to be Kenya. Did you know that agroforestry is one of the best ways to restore soil health, to sequester carbon in the soil, and also to diversify the sources of income of farmers? Our food team, including Nick Jeffries, has prepared or is preparing a series of videos to showcase uh, some of these gener regenerative practices. So let's see how agri agroforestry looks like at the Tamalu farm in central Kenya. Agroforestry is the practice of either agriculture in forestry systems or forestry in agricultural systems, so that trees and crops are on the same piece of land for long periods of time. Farmers are able to produce diverse portfolios of food, allowing them to make more income rather than when they are relying on just one crop or one enterprise. What we're standing in here are actually tunnels that used to grow flowers, and only two years ago it was just bush. Lots of weeds, very overgrown, and not much life. It's just amazing that you can bring that all back within less than two years. We decided to set up agroforestry because we wanted a food production system that produces superior quality, enhances soil, and sequesters as much carbon as possible, and enhances, of course, biodiversity. It's 
really when we first went to Brazil and discovered the advantages of Syntropic agroforestry over any other agroforestry, we realized a lot of the crops that they were using in Brazil are also in Africa. And so we knew we could do it here and just slightly change it ever so slightly just to fit into the local context. So if you can imagine in a natural forest, you've got lots of different levels. You've got your canopy crops, you've got your emergent above that, you've got your sub canopy, and then you've got your ground level stuff. In some circumstances, you even got stuff growing under the ground. And that's what we're strongly mimicking in a system like this. In Syntropic Agroforestry, everything is planted at the same time, be it from seed or from seedling. You start planting trees and other crops that begin to grow slowly and helping each other. Fast growers begin to diversify the system and produce food at the onset of the systems. So you've got a continuously self-propagating family of plants that build the soil for you. The difference between our Tamale and the neighbors is very evident. Our neighbors, the lands are there, or just one monocrop all the way. If it's dry season, it's just dry up that way. But in our system, it's always green, always bushy. In Tamale, we are living in a food forest. Even if it's just a normal tomato, if you taste it, it's not just juicy, but it has some flavor. It doesn't really matter what it is. If you taste it, mm, it's, it's really yummy. We've been having very superior quality produce from the farm. We started with families, but now we are at the online shops. We've been selling to restaurants, also locally in Nanyuki and Nairobi. And we are also selling our farm produce to some shops in Mombasa too. So we have a series of tours and it's very interactive and that involves a full farm circuit with the guys on the farm that give the background to the soil and the health and, and how it all comes together into this incredible produce. The end goal is to be able to consistently supply those big urban markets because that's part of the circular vision of this farm. What a great example of how of what agroforestry looks like in practice. Um, we will be releasing the full video in the following weeks, so please uh, stay tuned. Follow us on our channels, the Ella MacArthur Foundation channels, and you will see what other stories we are also going to be telling. Now, let me move. Uh, to my first online guest who also comes from Kenya and works very closely with farmers. Welcome Shina Shah to our Circular Economy show. Um, when I was talking to you before this session, you always you said to me that uh, you wear many hats. But I think one of the ways in which you described yourself was as a permaculture design consultant, also an educator and the director of Harvesting for Good East Africa. Um, but before we move to talk a little bit about your organization, I would like to ask you, uh, what is permaculture? Well, thank you for having me on the show. I'm looking forward to uh, going to many different topics here within this um, amazing, vast system. Um, so basically permaculture is derived from permanent agriculture. That's why the name is uh, per permaculture, so permanent agriculture. So we're going towards a very, or we're designing towards a very resilient system. And it basically it's based on ethics and principles that can be applied in many um, context around the globe. And it's a design methodology that walks you through the process of designing in harmony with the natural landscape with and also with an existing community. So you're really looking at the needs of that specific landscape and community and the people around to be able to design something that's going to work for them. I think that's what makes it so unique is that every design is very different. Um, and for the people. So it, it, it stands out as something that works. Or again, we talked a little bit about biodiversity there in the intro, and we're working towards a very robust, uh, diverse, and resilient system. So it is, um, and correct me if I, if I misunderstood, but it's about looking at the diversity that exists in nature, and it's about designing um, agricultural ecosystems that in a way, let's say, simulate uh, some of the things that work already in nature. Um, so how, how are permaculture solutions uh, connected to, let's say, climate change or building resilience in a specific context? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think when we look at 
some some of the agricultural practices that we've seen, you know, with the conventional practices, we often see one crop that's a monoculture system. And that system has failed us because we're basically depleting soils and landscapes over time. Uh, there's a lack of biodiversity and we're not holding water in the ground. And that that is that kind of funnels to all the climatic factors that we're seeing that are resulting to really poor health in, in plants and um, also, when we look at farmers' livelihoods, when they just go one crop um, and there's a pest in that whole system, we're basically seeing a failed crop for that entire season. So there's a failed livelihood there. And also, uh, the, the soil health is very poor in that, in that kind of um, context. And a permaculture system, we're, we're growing for biodiversity. So we are, we are basically mimicking nature's patterns. As I mentioned there, we're, we're using this methodology that, that can be used in any context. But we are really, really reading the landscape, where the wind comes from, the sun comes from, um, and, and how the water flows into the, in, in that particular piece of land, and putting a design in place that will also help soil health. So when we talk about regenerative systems, we're really building soil health, and that holds water for us. We're building this life to be able to give us quality food, and um, just like how we feed our bodies with good food, um, is what we have to do with the plants. It's like we're feeding the soil. Uh, it's the very basis of very good food production. And so if we're able to use a, a permaculture in the right kind of way, we have the toolkit in front of us, um, we can actually bring streams and, and, and um, water sources back just by planting enough trees, the right kind of plants, um, and see a very a, a difference in that landscape when we use these practices from this, from this particular toolkit. So you mentioned like like improvements in the biodiversity, improvements in the food, and you also mentioned the connection to health, healthy soils, healthy people um, as well. Could you now let's move a little bit to talk about your organization, Harvesting for Good uh, East Africa. Um, you you mentioned to me that the that the approach that you take is very bottom but bottom up. Um, could you give us an example? Of one of our pro of one of your projects and how how was this actually applied? Yes, uh, I was actually part of a very big development um, prior to harvesting for good East Africa, and that our role was really to educate uh, farmers and individuals and uh, people that were interested to dive into this topic. And so we saw a huge interest um, just with anyone walking in there and saying, "How can I grow enough food?" or what is soil health or what are the amendments like composting or using uh, you know, amendments that will actually improve soil health. And so we started to basically um, work with these individuals in different specialized courses and they'd come out and they'd train with us and we got scholarship funds to bring farmers on the courses. Uh, and that kind of drove more and more interest in this topic that, that sounds technical, but really using the traditional systems uh, that were actually practiced a long time ago. And it just essentially is a reminder to be able to use some of this. And so I basically started using the same um, ethos in, in the main mission was to actually empower these individuals and these farmers um, to educate them, to actually dive into very practical workshops where they would see it and be able to uh, use that where they were, to be able to document that. Uh, to get enough data collection that it was actually working in a, they were in a small space. And so at Harvesting for Good East Africa, we're basically working with homeowners and um, businesses and taking these individuals through these, these workshops or training from the very get-go in just improving the landscape by using some of these principles within the permaculture and biointensive farming methods. And we're seeing a lot of interest now and, and young people are coming to the fold um, and we talk a little bit about enterprise in there as well, like how can you create a value added product working with a, with a community? And so we, we've, we've, you know, worked with coffee farmers and also with farmers that were growing a certain type of aloe or, um, something that was adding value to be able to sustain a livelihood and to also give them the opportunity to, uh, take it forward, to spread the word, to say that it's actually working in a, and then they were achieving food security by many different by growing many different crops in one area. 
And Sina, you mentioned the youth. Um, one of the problems that we have in Europe uh, with agriculture is that a lot of the, the young people are not interested in working in this sector anymore. Is permaculture a way in Kenya to get youth, uh, to get the young people to be interested in agriculture and to maybe come, uh, come back to this sector or stay in this sector? Absolutely. I think a lot of young people in the communities are moving into the urban areas in the city and actually the you know, unemployment rates are growing uh, daily and uh, they are leaving. I think they look at agriculture as a punishment and it's not really something that's uh, uh, taken into consideration when you're looking for a career or something to go into. And a lot of the elderly take care of their farms. I think permaculture is this unique concept within design and actually mapping out things and being able to sketch and also think about enterprise and value added products. And I've been trying to um, use that to my ability to, to spread the message in that way and to actually model. I mean, if we don't actually demonstrate some of this work that we're talking about and be able to show these young people that it's achievable, like we saw in the video with the Tamalu um, project that's going on here, then we're not going to achieve that. So we need to be able to practice and model and be able to invite these young people to come in and see and, and a different way of agriculture and talk a different language with them that will un be understandable. Um, so I use actually my platform to be able to spread that message, message in, a, in a very different way. And I'm seeing young people come in now and actually take on some of those roles that have been missed um, within the agriculture sector here. So you've mentioned many things. You've mentioned in the permaculture is a way to empower these farmers to deliver some of these solutions. You have also mentioned uh, just just the, the importance that that it that or the, how important it is to also address the specific uh, needs uh, according to the context in these projects. And one one question that we have got from the audience already is from Pieter on LinkedIn. He is asking a question about uh, how uh, viable is it financially for farmers to switch uh, to regenerative agriculture. I guess in this case we can maybe focus specifically on, on permaculture and, and I think this question is quite related to what is required as well as well to scale some of these ideas. Yeah, some good questions there. I think a lot of young people have the same kind of questions or individuals in general. Um, they think about it as a small scale farming um, technique and I think that actually um, if you're able to model something that is viable and you're able to, to actually uh, have a value added or multiple value added products, like we have some projects here in Kenya um, that are actually doing this and it's taken, it's taken a few years to get there. But I think these are projects that we can learn from and understand the pros and cons and some of the failures they went through to be able to improve when we start something. And um, it is very achievable, I think, uh, even if it's a small holder, um, I think if you're able to use that land to its maximum, and that's what permaculture really dives into is using these different patterns to be able to, to, be able to achieve better production, more production, improvement of actual quality of those products. So like the, the crops itself, you can have various cash crops within that system and still be able to get it to the market uh, but it has to be in an organized way where you understand what you're doing, um, that you trial for a while and you see what, you know, to, to be less uh, kind of competent to the, kind of, sorry, less competitive to the to your neighbor who may be doing the same thing, is look out for something that, that can create a niche. And so something that we've done in, within our trainings or workshops with farmers is to really think about um, things that, that, people aren't doing around the area and start to kind of use that ability to train them and to uh, open up this conversation around what kind of indicators are they seeing that we could actually work with them and help them and guide them as they make the decisions on the ground that will be um, achievable. So yes, I think it is if, we, if we're able to do it correctly and use some of this uh, in a very strategic way. Thank you, Sina. Thank you for telling us a little bit more about some of the of the challenges that the that these farmers uh, encounter when applying permaculture, and also some of the opportunities that that we can see in applying uh, this specific regenerative agriculture practice. It's, it is. It seems like. Design is one of the key aspects. It's about designing uh, specific solutions that better meet that better meet the needs of the of people, of the farmers, and also our planet. Thank you so much. Now 
we also uh, need big businesses to be part of the solution. Big businesses which have a big influence and a, and a huge power to change things. And that's exactly why I want to introduce now my second guest. So this is our second uh, stop in this tour. Uh, we are going to France now and I'm joined by Jeanette Coombs Lanot, the One Planet Advocacy Lead from Danone. Jeanette, welcome to the show. I know that probably most people are familiar with uh, what Danone is and what you do, but could you give us a short intro to this and maybe just for context a bit about the size of your organization? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm really just so delighted to be here. So thank you. Um, Danan, you might know some of our iconic brands, Activia, Alpro, Evian. Um, so we're a food and drinks company, but we're special in a couple of ways. So first we have a, a, a health focused product portfolio and we're actually the world's leading company, both in dairy and plant-based uh, products. So we have this sort of uh, unique positioning to help consumers transition to more uh, regenerative food systems by integrating more plant-based in their diets. Another thing that makes us unique is the way we do business. You may know the B Corp movement, which certifies companies based on the highest standards of environmental, social, and, and governance criteria. And uh, a lot of B Corps are companies like Patagonia, they're more agile, but actually the world's the biggest B Corp is Dan in North America. And we're on a journey to become the first multinational, one of the first multinational B Corps in the world. And actually 50% of our sales are already covered by B Corp certification. You asked me about size. So just to give you a, a perspective, um, in addition to plant-based and dairy, we also have a, a waters uh, division and a specialized nutrition uh, division that, that focuses both on medical nutrition and early life nutrition. So three business divisions were present in 120 countries and we have over 100,000 employees. Wow, so we're talking about a really, really huge business here, Jeanette. And you mentioned, uh, B Corp and, and some of your ambitions there, but I want I would like you to tell us a bit more about what are your ambitions when it comes to circular economy and also specifically to regenerative uh, food production. Yeah, so, you know, a, a lot of people, when they think about circular economy, they tend to focus, even with, sometimes even with Endanon on the materials, right? The fibers, plastics, and, and how to keep them in use. And that's absolutely critical. And a big part of our focus is on building this circular economy of packaging, where we're keeping paper and metal and plastic um, in circulation. So that's by, you know, making sure it's 100% recyclable, integrating, reintegrating recycled material, which we're, we're really accelerating on and also expanding uh, reuse models. So actually 30%, around 30% of our, our product volumes are already sold in reusable packaging. So we're really working to expand that. But um, we, as you mentioned earlier on the show, um, the circular economy is also about regenerating natural systems and building systems that do this. And when we talk about a regenerative food system, we're talking about both what's on your plate and what companies like Danon help put on your plate and, and, and really looking at how we can, we can create diets that, that respect can respect planetary boundaries worldwide with more plant-based, for instance. And we're also looking, when we talk about building regenerative food systems, at how you produce your ingredients, how food is produced. And on this, um, we're, we're really focusing a lot on regenerative agriculture. So you were mentioning on the show earlier how agriculture is associated with a lot of the challenges we face, like climate change, biodiversity loss, water scarcity. Uh, for Denon, agriculture represents about two thirds of our carbon footprint and 90% of our water footprint. So it's really where a lot of our, our, our environmental impact is. But the thing is that, you know, it can be a problem and it can also be a solution to these challenges through regenerative practices like the ones we've been talking about by reducing tillage, by using more cover crops. Um, and so we've really embraced this model. In fact, we announced uh, that we were really focusing on regenerative agriculture um, in 2017, just after I joined Danone. So... I mean, and, and I guess that uh, as well, uh, you, you are a huge business, so you also have to be thinking a lot about your long term um, growth strategy and, and all these things. And, and I wonder, 
Uh, why did you decide to work on this? We, we just, you just said that, yes, it's, it's the problem. Yes, it can also be the solution. But why is it important for a big company to work on circular economy? Yeah, that's a great question. So, uh, well, first of all, we, we, um, we have what we call a frame of action at Danan called One Planet, One Health. And this is, this is really, really explaining our, our conviction that the health of the planet and health of people are deeply intertwined. And we're really designing our business to help protect and nurture both. So when you talk about regenerative food production, that's really a key way you deliver on that promise to protect and nourish One Planet, One Health. But it's definitely a business decision too. Um, you, the first thing you have to think about as a business is resilience in your, in your supply chain. And as we see more and more the effects of climate change, as we see more water scarcity, one third of soils roughly worldwide are degraded, um, that's gonna have an impact on the ability of companies like Danone to source our ingredients. So when we invest in regenerative agriculture and supply chain, we're really investing in the resilience of our supply chain. Also, regenerative agriculture is really kind of uniquely placed to respond to what consumers are asking for more and more. I mean, I think we see a new consumer survey every day that, that shows that consumers more and more, they want to know where the food comes from. They want to know the impact it has on their communities, on nature. And I think, well, the way we conceive it at least, which is, which is social, but also environmental, um, is really uniquely placed to respond to this. So it's a great toolkit for Denon's brands to build connection and engagement with consumers. So it is, it is good for the planet, but it's also a great opportunity for businesses to create uh, long-term growth and also resilience, as you mentioned, very important aspect to take into account. So now we, we know the ambitions of the known, we know why you are working on these, but let's talk a little bit about how you plan to get there and how you plan to achieve those. Um, what do some of the regenerative um, agriculture practices that you are implementing look like? Could you give us some examples? Yeah, absolutely. So well, after we, we announced our decision to, to really focus in on regenerative agriculture in 2017, we, we first um, focused a lot on defining uh, what, what the concept was for us. So we worked with Ellen MacArthur Foundation, with other partners, and, and especially with WWF in France uh, to build a definition that's holistic, um, that includes first soil and, and how, you, how you restore and protect soil so that it can draw carbon, so that it can strengthen the biodiversity, so that it can protect water. Um, but it's also about farmers and farm workers and, and really empowering this new generation um, that that's really shifting the model of, of what the, the role of farmers in society. So it's no longer just about only providing us with food, even if that's absolutely key. It's also about, I mean, really being custodians of, of the land and, and mitigating climate change and, and protecting water resources. So, um, so another pillar in our strategy is really looking at how we can make sure that the model is economically viable. And I know you spoke a little bit about that earlier, and it's something we've also we're also focusing a lot on. And the third pillar is about animals, which we believe have a, a fundamental place in healthy ecosystems. And but we think that regenerative agriculture must also ensure strong standards of animal welfare. So we really uh, define this concept in a holistic way, and at the same time we started building proof of concept. So we have a, a number of regenerative agriculture programs around the world. We have the biggest regenerative dairy program in the US. Uh, we're on, on track to source 100% of in locally grown ingredients in France from regenerative agriculture by 2025. And we also have programs in Mexico, in Algeria, in Romania. So, so we're really seeing proof of concept as well. Um, and I guess m many people would say, uh, as, a, as, a, as an important and a huge business, uh, and the kind of the, the percentage of the market that you that you have, that you have a, a responsibility, I guess, to to lead on on the solutions and to lead this transition towards a, a more a circular economy. Do you agree? And, and do you have a plan to scale some of, of these projects that you just mentioned? Yeah, I think it's it's a responsibility and it's also an opportunity. I mean, I think these are we're building the business models of tomorrow. We're building the food system of tomorrow. So, um, so it, it's absolutely critical to 
scale, as you were saying. And, and of course, the thing about systems is that no one company, no matter how big it is, can drive systemic change on its own. So we're really putting collaboration at the center of our approach to, to bring scale. And that includes includes with other companies. So we have, um, we created a couple of coalitions actually. We have a coalition called Farming for Generations that's really unique because it brings together um, world leading experts on you know, every part of the dairy uh, value chain. So animal welfare, animal health, crop nutrition um, to try to build really the, the best in class practices that then we can share uh, across our, our, our value chain. And then we have another coalition that we that we created called One Planet Business for Biodiversity that brings together companies from different sectors, from beauty, fashion, food, um, all with agricultural supply chains. And the idea is really to 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 own and to to uh, lean into the business the role business plays in protecting and strengthening biodiversity and a fundamental pillar of this is regenerative agriculture. So really new forms of cooperation within the private sector are critical. I mentioned, you know, we need, we need experts. We need the world's leading experts. We need Ellen MacArthur Foundation. We need, we need WWF in France. Um, and then the other, the other key player in this, of course, is the public sector. The public sector has a, an enormous role in, in shaping the agricultural systems uh, in, in the world. And what's really I'd say encouraging is that as companies like Danan, but we're certainly not the only one, there's more and more companies that are, are focusing on this as a model. As we're scaling, as we're, as we're ramping up regenerative agriculture programs, you have on the other side, really a growing interest within the public sector in this model and how you can use regenerative agriculture to, uh, to uh, deliver on some of the climate goals, to uh, build sustainable food systems. So we at least see a lot of activity, both in the private and the public sector. And I think the next few years will be absolutely critical in kind of redefining the way we work together and ensuring that we're really um, bringing all this energies we can in order to scale and, and, and really change the system. I'm really happy you mentioned the public sector because we're going to be talking to them in one second. Um, one last question for you, Jeanette. Um, how, how do we bring these to our customers? You mentioned that customers are, are more and more interested in buying better uh, products and buying products that are having a positive impact on the environment and, and that they can, of, of course, afford affordability is also a very important aspect. How does the known tell this story to, to customers? Um, how do you get them engaged? Well, as you say, uh, consumers are absolutely critical to scaling this and really transforming the food system and, and, and driving demand. And there's a lot of opportunity and possibility because they're more and more interested in, uh, in, in, in foods and in food and beverages that can have a positive impact. Um, what's interesting about regenerative agriculture is that there's no one dominant label like you know, there, there is with organic where, where consumers can immediately recognize. Uh, so, so there's a big opportunity you know, to, to engage them in a different way. And I think regenerative agriculture is so powerful. It, it's a toolbox to engage consumers, um, but there are a lot of different angles. So you, you see actually in Danan brands uh, looking at different angles they can use. So we have Horizon Organic, which is the, the biggest organic milk company in the US, um, really drawing on regenerative agriculture to, um, to really engage on climate. So it's announced it's an objective to be carbon positive by 2025, which is really quite ambitious for a, a dairy company. And at the same time, you have Bledina, for instance, which is a baby food company in France, um, taking another angle. So they really focus more on biodiversity and how they can engage with consumers on this. They invite consumers to the farms where ingredients are grown so they can understand the model, they can see, you know, they can understand how biodiversity at farms brings more biodiversity in, on the plates. And they're also really kind of um, getting more and more involved in protecting specific fruit and vegetable species in France. So they have a campaign called Save the Williams Pear, um, which is actually the Williams Pear in France is, uh, is under pressure. 
the, the supply chain. So, so Bledina is actually stepping in and providing more support for farmers, engaging consumers, and their goal in 2021 is to plant 40,000 Williams pear trees. So really protecting that, that biodiversity in France as well. And then you see, you know, so you see other angles. Uh, just recently, Harmless Harvest, which is, uh, has a lot of products around coconuts, they announced a regenerative coconut program in Thailand, which focuses on sustainability, but also on, on really empowering uh, the coconut farmers in Thailand. So you see different angles, biodiversity, climate, social, um, lots of possibility, I think. And what's also, I think, interesting moving forward is that there's some indications that key components of regenerative agriculture are really starting to um, resonate with consumers. Just recently, there was a study by Hartman, which tracks organic consumer trends in the US, which found that in 2020, organic consumers in the US were, were focused on climate change, sustainability, quality, but the kind of unifying factor for them was soil. So big opportunity, but still a ways to go to engage consumers to, to uh, and I think you know everything that you're doing, what Sheena is doing is absolutely critical to building this movement from the ground up. Of course, and we need we need we need customers as well to be part of this. And thank you, Janet. That's all that we have uh, time for today with you. Uh, we have seen that really this is also an opportunity for businesses, not just to be part of the solution to do better, but also to have long term growth. So thank you so much uh, for being with us today. So now we've heard from farmers, we've heard from educators working with them, and we've also heard from a big business, but we are missing one piece of the puzzle, and that is policy and regulation. We need policymakers to establish a common vision and also to establish the rules of the game if we really want a circular economy to scale, whether it's in a city, whether it's in a region or a country. Um, now we are going to be, we are, now, we are going to move in we're moving to our final stop, which is Sao Paulo in Brazil, where we are going to be hearing from Nicole Gauvet, uh, for the manager of the initiative Connect the Dots, which has been shortlisted by Apolitical as one of the 100 climate policy breakthroughs. My colleague Mike Oliveira, the city's activation manager for our Latin American team, was in conversation with her very recently to discuss how policies and initiatives like these can help support farmers to pursue regenerative practices. But before uh, we watch that conversation, we are playing a very short teaser of, of our documentary that will be released later this year in April about what a circular economy for food in Sao Paulo looks like. De onde vem esse produto? Quem produziu? É como ele foi feito? O que, que tem por trás dessa família agricultora? Aqui a gente tem produtores ofertando produtos saudáveis, produtos frescos, produtos de qualidade, produtos que a cidade quer comprar. A gente está falando de um recorte de zona rural sul de São Paulo, que é uma zona de mananciais hídricos que abastece um terço da população de São Paulo. Apesar de ser muito próximo da cidade, é um desafio enorme você escoar essa produção, organizar, fazer o planejamento e ter uma possibilidade de adequação ao mercado que é bastante complexo para uma agricultura que é a agricultura familiar. São Paulo já conta com cinco centros de compostagem. E esse composto que é produzido nesses centros, ele retorna para o produtor rural. Os parques de compostagem da cidade de São Paulo em operação têm capacidade para receber em torno de 15 mil toneladas por ano de resíduos. Em cada etapa desse caminho, existem pequenos desperdícios. E é isso que a gente precisa olhar nessa economia circular. A gente tem bons exemplos do que seria um caminho revolucionário em relação a como que a gente produz um círculo virtuoso de produção de alimentos e, e de consumo. É uma revolução possível. É preciso juntar os atores corretos, é preciso articular. Por enquanto, esses exemplos gritam, esses exemplos são importantes, mas eles ainda não são a regra. A gente precisa que isso ganhe muita escala.
Oi, pessoal, tudo bem? Eu sou o Mike, eu trabalho com cidades na América Latina para acelerar a transição para uma economia circular, e dentre elas, a cidade de São Paulo, que é uma das cidades estratégicas para a Fundação Alema Cap, com várias oportunidades, iniciativas e frentes para que o território se torne mais circular e mais resiliente. E uma das oportunidades para a cidade de São Paulo, mapeadas no nosso relatório de cidades e economia circular dos alimentos, diz que o desenho de uma economia circular na cidade representa uma oportunidade de mais de 140 milhões de dólares para criar um sistema alimentar regenerativo, distribuído e socialmente inclusivo. Esses benefícios podem ser alcançados em um cenário em que a produção e suprimento local de alimentos sejam expandidos usando práticas regenerativas e fazendo com que cerca de 25% dos produtos orgânicos municipais sejam convertidos em fertilizantes orgânicos para os agricultores locais. E para compartilhar um pouco do que São Paulo está fazendo na agricultura regenerativa e na frente de agroecologia, eu convido aqui a Nicole. A Nicole Gobê, ela é gerente do projeto Ligue os Pontos e ela vai contar um pouquinho para a gente sobre o que é o projeto. Bem-vinda, Nicole. Tudo bem, Mike? Obrigada pelo convite. Bom, Nicole, eu quero fazer algumas perguntas para você sobre o projeto. A primeira delas é saber se você pode nos contar o que é o projeto Ligue os Pontos e o que que levou esse projeto a ser encabeçado e liderado pela Prefeitura da cidade de São Paulo. Bom, o projeto Ligue os Pontos é um projeto pensado para fortalecer e consolidar a zona rural da cidade de São Paulo, que representa um terço de todo o território da cidade e que, de certa forma, estava adormecida, vamos dizer, frente às políticas públicas da cidade. Então, é um projeto pensado para é, visibilizar e trazer um olhar, jogar a luz ao território e as possibilidades que ele representa. Ele é, O projeto ele é organizado em três frentes de ações principais. Então, tem uma linha que é o fortalecimento é, junto aos agricultores, trabalhando diretamente com uma equipe de campo de assistência técnica junto aos produtores rurais do território rural sul da cidade de São Paulo, que é o recorte do projeto. Tem uma linha é, que trabalha a fortalecimento da cadeia de valor como um todo da agricultura e do alimento, então é, estabelecendo links entre agricultores e mercados, visibilizando novos e melhores mercados e possibilitando o acesso a esses mercados. E uma linha de dados e evidências que é um trabalho de atualização é, e levantamento de dados oficiais para serem é, embasar aí as políticas públicas da cidade de São Paulo como um todo. Ele é um projeto que ganhou o prêmio é, Majors Challenge em 2016 da Bloomberg Philanthropies e que vem sendo executado pela Prefeitura de São Paulo desde 2018. Bom, como você mencionou agora, o projeto ganhou um prêmio da Bloomberg, né? Então, eu queria que você compartilhasse com a gente também Quais foram os sucessos que esse projeto obteve nesse tempo todo, desde 2018, e quais impactos que ele trouxe para a cidade? Bom, para falar da, da, da frente de fortalecimento da agricultura, o projeto ele iniciou aí com o um cadastramento desses produtores rurais do território da Zona Sul, onde dentro desses produtores a gente trabalha diretamente com 150 produtores, agricultores familiares, que produzem é, principalmente hortaliças no território, com uma equipe de assistência técnica é, prestando aí a assistência diretamente a esses produtores, melhorando, tentando né, no, no, estímulo, no estímulo a melhorar a produção rural, a melhorar a capacidade produtiva, a inserção das boas práticas agrícolas e também fomentando a transição de uma agricultura convencional para uma agricultura agroecológica regenerativa. Então, a gente tem uma série é, de atividades vinculadas a essa frente, onde a nossa equipe de assistência técnica é, entra com recursos como insumos orgânicos para mostrar para o agricultor como é feita a transição de uma agricultura convencional para uma agricultura agroecológica regenerativa, né? É, fomentando aí que ele é, adeque essa produção para essas novas práticas também, para que ele tenha é, uma independência né, de insumos externos da propriedade, né, para que ele é, vá reduzindo o uso de, de insumos químicos, insumos sintéticos, e passe a usar, então, tudo aquilo que é produzido 
é, na própria propriedade dele, como adubação verde, é, adubação orgânica, enfim. É, então, essa frente de agricultura, ela está estabelecida, a gente tem essa equipe trabalhando em campo e isso está tá, 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 tá sendo possível ver esse resultado muito bom nessa transição dos agricultores. A gente está falando agora que a gente está alcançando 50% dos nossos agricultores atendidos em transição agroecológica até o final do projeto, agora que é em junho de 2021. Na linha de cadeia de valor, a gente identificou uma série de possibilidades né, para de visibilizar os produtores e entre elas a gente lançou uma plataforma de conexão entre o urbano e o rural, trazendo todas essas informações da cadeia de valor para um único lugar. Então é um site aberto, público, onde você é, pode é, encontrar informações né, de quem produz na cidade, o que produz, né, quais são os mercados que estão comprando na cidade esses produtos locais, aonde estão as feiras que é, têm esses produtos dos produtores locais na cidade, é, tem uma aba também de políticas públicas é, e iniciativas da cidade de São Paulo, visando é, essa visibilização né, dos produtores rurais e da zona, da, da zona rural sul como um todo. E, além disso, a, a frente de dados e evidências que trouxe toda essa atualização desses dados para a Prefeitura de São Paulo. Então, pelo que você está me contando, é um projeto que vai muito além da assistência técnica. né? Ele, com Sim. certeza, a assistência técnica é um eixo do projeto para que esse produtor faça a transição para práticas regenerativas e agroecológicas, mas, além disso, ele também tem um, aí, um, uma combinação de dados que podem levar, por exemplo, a, a utilizar a prefeitura da cidade, a utilizar esses dados como ferramenta para a criação de políticas públicas. Né? Valeu, agora eu queria te perguntar como você acha que o projeto contribui para a economia circular dos alimentos na cidade de São Paulo? Bom, Mike, como você mesmo falou no começo da nossa conversa, dessa entrevista, a cidade de São Paulo já faz, né, já tem muitas atividades que estão vinculadas à economia circular do alimento. Né? Tem, então, tem muitos atores né, dentro da prefeitura, trabalhando individualmente para que a coisa aconteça. E agora, nesse momento, eu vejo que isso tudo está começando a se linkar dentro da prefeitura, até com essa articulação de vocês, né, com a Ellen MacArthur trabalhando junto e mostrando essas possibilidades todas da economia circular do alimento. O que eu vejo de é, que o projeto traz, né, para é, como um, uma, um apoio, uma intervenção nesse fluxo todo, é que com esse financiamento da Bloomberg a gente conseguiu pilotar muitas ações que podem ser escaladas dentro da cidade. Então, eu acho que isso é super importante e isso eu acho que é um, é, é uma, é um ganho para a cidade como um todo. Bom, para finalizar, Nicole, eu quero te perguntar o que, que vem a seguir, quais são os próximos passos aí do projeto? Bom, é, a ideia é replicar, né, como eu falei, fazer essa replicação do projeto para outras cidades, estados, países interessados, então a gente está num movimento de apresentação, né, em fóruns, workshops, com temas relacionados ao que a gente trabalha, porque a ideia, um, um dos objetivos do financiador é justamente isso, né, você pilotar dentro de uma cidade e fazer a replicação para outras cidades que é, são é, possíveis né, de replicar, o que a gente teve aqui é, de iniciativa. E também é, o projeto, nesse momento, ele está na fase final né, de, de execução. O financiamento que a gente tem hoje pela Bloomberg, ele se encerra em junho de 2021. E a ideia é que a gente busque novos, novas parcerias, novos financiadores para manter pelo menos uma parte do projeto que a cidade de São Paulo não consegue absorver totalmente. Muito obrigado, Nicole. É, o trabalho de vocês é incrível, é excelente. É, nós, como Fundação Anima Carpo, nós super apoiamos o trabalho de vocês e acreditamos muito que esse projeto seja aí um dos principais para mover a cidade realmente para que ela se torne mais circular e regenerativa. Bom, eu conversei com a Nicole, gestora do projeto Liga os Pontos, é, e agora eu passo a palavra para minha amiga Laura, que continua aí com vocês no estúdio. Obrigado. Obrigada. 
Thank you, Mike, and thank you, Nicole. It is great to see that these initiatives are planned to be replicated across cities, states, and hopefully even countries. You have mentioned some of the multiple benefits that regenerative practices have. They help us restore biodiversity, connect fresh and healthy food with people in cities. They help us create jobs in this sector and also divert food from ending up in landfills. Unfortunately, we have this episode is coming to an end and we've heard how regenerative food practices are relevant everywhere around the world and how they look different wherever you are and how important context is when applying them. My main takeaway is that regenerative agriculture is one of the greatest opportunities for the food system to move away from being a key contributor to climate change to being one of the key actors in the solution. Thank you so much for watching us online at home. And thank you for posting and sending us your questions. We stream every other Tuesday at, th at the same time, 3 p.m. UK time. And if you want to find out more about the episodes we have coming up, please check our website. If you want to stay tuned as well, the best way is to, be su to subscribe to our YouTube channel or to follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and you will get a notification whenever we go live. If you want to help us out even more, please like this video and share it with your friends and colleagues. We really appreciate your feedback and we welcome you to be on board with us on this journey to learn about the circular economy. Thank you again, and I will see you in two weeks in the Circular Economy Show.